Volume 2, Book 3, The Tuileries, Chapter 1, Epimenides. So let's just write down what the Tuileries actually are. It was a royal palace right in the center of France where King Louis XVI, Louis XVI, was brought after the insurrection of the women, which we saw in Part 7, where he was no longer allowed to stay in Versailles and he had to come to the center of Paris to the Tuileries. Now, the Tuileries, this is a photograph of it from 1860. It was burnt down in, during the Paris Commune of 1871. But you can see here that it here's a straight shot look to uh, the Champs-Élysées. There's the Place de la Concorde. And if we look at it on the on maps, it would have been this is right in the center of Paris. Ile de Cité here in the bottom right. The Louvre Tuileries Gardens are conjoint gardens because on the one side you used to have the, the Palais de Tuileries and then in the other you have the Louvre and here is exactly where it would have stood between the Jus de Pomme and the uh, Musée Lingerie where we are in modern day just in front of the Place de la Concorde so that's where it is and as you can see it's right in the centre of Paris that's just to give some context to where the king is during this during this book, the Tuileries and as for Epimenides, who is the title of the first chapter, Carlyle is talking about the ancient Greek philosopher from Crete, who it was said stayed in a Cretan cave for some 57 years and later emerged out. He's probably most famous for his paradox, which is, as a Cretan, uh, giving the statement, all Cretans are liars. And the Epimenides uh, then comes from Mont Gaillard, dans le sommeil se serait prolongé. So let's carry on. How true that there is nothing dead in this universe. What we call dead is only changed, its forces working in inverse order. The leaf that lies rotting in moist winds, says one, has still force, else how could it rot? The gods themselves, sings Pindar, cannot annihilate the action that is done. Another very Carlylean idea. Force rolls in circles, billowing, many-streamed, harmonious, wide as immensity, deep as eternity. Beautiful and terrible, not to be comprehended. This is what man names existence and universe. This thousand-tinted flame image, at once veil and revelation, reflex such as he, in his poor brain and heart, can paint, of one unnameable dwelling in an inaccessible light, from beyond the star galaxies, from before the beginning of days. It billows and rolls round thee. The beginning holds it in the end, and all that leads thereto as the acorn does the oak and its fortunes. So what then, your Epimenides? Your somnolent Peter Klaus, since named Rip Van Winkle, awakens again, he finds it a changed world. Was yesterday a restless problem? Has today grown a belief burning to be uttered. On the morrow, contradiction has exasperated it into mad fanaticism. Yesterday there was the oath of love. Today has come the curse of hate. Rest not. Continue not. Forward to thy doom. So that's just his opening gambit there for the book. That if you had awoken now like Epimenides did in his cave, find the world utterly changed. That's how many of France and of wider Europe would have felt at this point during the revolution. But in seasons of revolution, continues Carlyle, which indeed distinguish themselves from common seasons by their velocity, mainly, uh, again, that's the sort of Carlylean take there, change is ever occurring, but what constitutes a revolution is the velocity of change. Peter Klaus stated with the jubilee of that Federation day, had lain down, say, directly after the blessing of Talleyrand, and Peter sleeps through them all. So Peter Klaus here is sort of the sleeper, the Epimenides in Carla's vision. Through one circling year, as we say, from July the 14th of 1790 till July 17th of 1791. July the 17th, 1791 is the Champ de Mar massacre. So the Champ de Mar massacre is a massacre uh, which happens at a quelling down of Republicans who were upset that that the Constituent Assembly in 1791 decreed that uh, Louis XVI would remain as a constitutional monarch. So this this is the sense of revolution, this is the speed um, that we're talking about. And as you can see, characters we've already met, Georges Danton, Camille Desmoulins, they led that crowd. 
So a Swiderous official person call him, for instance, Lafayette. This is the person who will quell it. Suddenly startled after year and day, uh, on from the Fête de la Fédération, by huge grape shot, tumbles, scares, not less astonished as what Peter Klaus would have done. Alas, offences must come. The sublime feast of pikes, with its effulgence of brotherly love, unknown since the age of gold, has changed nothing. So it was all just pageantry. Gospel of Jean-Jacques has come, and the first sacrament of it has been celebrated. Chapter 2. The Wakeful. Throats or journals there are, as men count, to the number of some hundred and thirty-three. Of various calibre, from your Cheniers, Gorsuses, Camilles, down to your Marat, down to your insipid Hébert of the Père Duchesne. These are some of the characters. We have André Chénier, uh, the French poet, poet of the revolution. It was mentioned there. He'll come up again later. Uh, we are, of course, aware of Camille Desmoulins, which was a journalist, mainly at the time, schoolmate of Robespierre, political ally of Danton, um, pushing for the Republican side of things, not happy with the Mirabeau side, uh, the rightist side of the revolution. But will he go as far as Robespierre and Jacobins? Not quite. He brings it back a little bit from there. And, of course, the other key figure is uh, Jean-Paul Marat, the physician who had the new... He was editor, though, as well as being the physician, was editor of the newspaper L'Ami du Peuple, so the friend of the people. And you can see that's what Carlyle's getting at. All these people who owned editorials, they continue. They talk about that rapid change, which turns what is a normal progression into a revolution. And that's why Carlyle's consistent that we are still in the revolution, two years on from the Bastille. As for Marat, the people's friend, which of course he gets from his, he gets from there, his, his uh, editorial, his voice is that of the bullfrog. We also have Sir Mortier, treasonous Riquetti Mirabeau's, traitors, or else shadows and simulacra of quacks, to be seen in high places, look what you will, men that go mincing, grimacing with plausible speech and brushed raiment, hollow within, quacks political, quacks scientific, academical. Quack public spirit. Not great Lavoisier himself or any of the forty can escape this rough tongue, which wants not fanatic sincerity, nor strangers of all, a certain rough, caustic sense. So he talks about Antoine Lavoisier there. He was, he was known as mainly a chemist, but he was also in the French nobility. So Lavoisier too would meet, like Camille de Milan, would meet his end by guillotine. But for now, he is a social reformer, and has been part of the chemical revolution of the 18th century, a man of science... But from the nobility, even he is brought into the quackery, as Carlyle says. Whereas without good morals, liberty is impossible. There in these dens of Satan, which one knows and perservingly denounces Du Sir Mottier's mouchard, consort and colleague. Yeah, when he talks about Sir Mottier, he's also talking about Lafayette. They are the same character, yeah, Gilbert de Mottier. Sol Morat is sick with sight. But what remedy? To erect 800 gibbets in convenient rows and to proceed hoisting, Sir Morat is full on. Let's get hoisting. Let's kill the enemy. The mitre de poste will not send out the horses till you have well nigh quarrelled with them. It is now January 1791. This people is no longer called Gaulish, and has wholly become bracketous, has got breaches, and suffered change enough. Certain fierce German Franken came storming over and, so to speak, vaulted on the back of it, and always after, in their grim, tenacious way, have ridden it, bridled. For German is, by his very name, a gay man, or a man that wars and gars. So, Carlyle there is saying, a part of what we have in the revolution is this feeling that the upper nobility class were always an imposition on the French, coming over from Frankish roots. I mean, it's, for me, it's quite absurd uh, it, that Frankish kingdom is the foundation of France itself. But the Gauls here have a feeling of that they've been oppressed. It's the classic oppression narrative. And that they're actually, oh, all the nobility were, they were coming over and invading us. So we deserve to take back from them what has been stolen from us ancestrally. That kind of begins to morphologize itself inside the mind of certain revolutionaries. The passion of constitutionalism, still more to royalism, which see all their own clubs fail and die. Clubism will naturally grow to seem the root of all evil. So we had all the clubs earlier. Lafayette had his own club and Marat would have had his and... 
Camille de Milan and Danton have theirs, and then of course the Jacobin club is the most notorious of all. But what we're seeing is the rightist clubs, the constitutional clubs, are naturally failing. They're failing because they can't keep up the speed of the revolution. The revolution happens to a certain point at which they're happy with, and then they're on the back guard. But the clubs only exist as a mechanical device to breed revolution. So once you reach the stage you're happy with, the club no longer suffices and it dies away. So only the more extreme clubs carry on, and then to those that were part of clubs that have failed and are happy with where, how far the revolution has gone and want no further, clubism will seem to be the root of all evil. Jacobinism alone has gone down to the deep subterranean lake waters, and may, unless filled in, flow there, copious, continual, like an artesian well to the great deep have drained itself up, and all be flooded and submerged, and Noah's deluge out deluged. The deluge there being an interesting phenomenon. The deluge is the flood, which of course is a great rise, um, sea change, which also can be quite quick. Flood can, can materialize on the plains that are susceptible to it quicker than those who have not lived to see it would realize it would be quite dangerous. And that's why the, the deluge myth is so powerful. Because at the one hand, it washes away what is uh, stagnant, or it washes away what is old. But on the other hand, it's it's a very violent act. It's, it's something which loses control of itself. There's Te Deums for Fauché, there's Procureur General de Verité, Attorney General of Truth. So they're appointing the Attorney General of Truth, so he has dubbed himself. The sort of ludicrous titles they're coming out with. The winter is hard and cold. Ragged bake. So now we have another hard and cold winter. But this time, can you blame the old nobility, Louis says, in the same way as before? There's Baker's Cues, like a black tattered flag of distress. They wave out ever and anon. It is the third of our hunger years, this new year of a glorious revolution. So in the summer of 1790, they had the Fête de la Fédération, and they proclaimed, all was great, this is the age of gold. And already in the first winter, they're beginning to struggle. The sum total whereof is the French Revolution, tongue of man cannot tell. It's decentralized. With amazement, not with measurement, men look on at the immeasurable. Not knowing its laws, seeing, with all different degrees of knowledge, what new phases, results of events and laws bring forth. France is as monstrous as a galvanic mass, wherein all sorts are far stranger than chemical galvanic or electric forces or substances are at work, electrifying one another, positive and negative, filling with electricity your Leiden jars. Twenty-five millions in number. As the jars get full... There will, from time to time, be, on slight hint, an explosion. Hinting at Lavo Lavoisier's chemical revolution, and then comparing it to the French Revolution. Chapter 3. Sword in Hand. This is the dying of the Abbe Moret faction. There is a constitutional theory of defective verbs and struggling forward, with perseverance amid endless interruptions. Mirabeau, from his tribune, with the weight of his name and genius, awing down much Jacobin violence. So Mirabeau is really a bulwark against the uh, further disintegration and acceleration of the revolution. Pure patriotism does not now count him among her chosen. Pure royalism abhors him, yet his weight with the world is overwhelming. But the chosen band of pure patriot brothers is small, counting only some thirty, seated now on the extreme tip of the left, a virtuous pétillon, an incorruptible Robespierre, most consistent incorruptible of thin, acrid men. Triumvirs Bernard, Duport Le Meth, great in speech, thought, action, each according to his kind, a lean old Goupil de Prefel. On these and what will follow them has pure patriotism to depend. There are two conspicuous among the thirty, if seldom audible, Philippe d'Orléans, may be seen sitting in dim, fulgurous bewilderment, having one might say arrived at chaos. Philippe's money, they say, is now gone. This is Philippe Duc d'Orléans, a strong admirer of the British constitutional monarchy, and had funneled and funded a lot of the earlier parts of the revolution. He's now staring at this sort of aghast of, of what he has unleashed. But a pamphlet can be printed without cash, or indeed written without food purchasable by cash. Projects require cash. How much more do widespread intrigues, which live and exist by cash, 
lying widespread with dragon appetite for cash fit to swallow princedoms. It is an epic preternatural machinery of suspicion that grows out of this want of cash, want of food, and so on. So to create preternatural suspicion, this was his function in the revolutionary epos, the function of Louis Philippe, was to create the suspicion through funneling cash, funneling the journals, and so on. But now the suspicion is coming from the lack of this funding, and it's outside its control. The Côte persists no less, so they still try this right side of the assembly. Nay, with more animation than ever, though hope has now well nigh fled. Abbe More, who we have, and this is where the sword in hand is going to talk about the death of his faction. He still exists, and he says, There is but one way of dealing with it, and that is to fall sword in hand on those gentry there. Sabre aleman se gaiad la. Things ripen towards downright incompatibility and what is called scission. That fierce theoretic onslaught of Fulsignes was August 1790. Next August will not have come till famed 292, the chosen of royalism, make solemn final scission from an assembly given up to faction, and depart shaking the dust off their feet. What Carlyle is alluding to there is uh, the future date in which the royalism will be defeated and kicked out from the assembly. The dust off their feet is from Matthew. It would seem as if an august assembly itself, traitor's royalism in its despair, had taken to a new course, that of cutting off patriotism by systematic duel. So this is uh, an insight into the sort of suspicion levels that we get. One is that royalism is trying to duel and challenge certain key uh, revolutionaries to duels uh, in a means to cut it off. This is one of the suspicions that arise. Bully swordsman, Spadassan, uh, of that party, go swaggering. Twelve Spadassans was seen by the yellow eye of journalism arriving recently out of Switzerland. Also a considerable number of assassins, nombre considerable d'assassins, uh, exercising in fencing schools and at pistol targets. So this is quite reminiscent of, if you know, the, the, the terror invoked by Stalin, in which there are foreign suspicion, uh, foreign people coming in, uh, infiltrating Ukrainian factories and there's a growth of suspicion around all of that practice. It's quite similar, except now it's duelists coming in from Switzerland, so a bit more strange, perhaps, or maybe just more of its time. How many cartels has Mirabeau had, then? In autumn, have we not the duel of Casal and Barnave, and uh, we called Barnave, Barnave you mentioned earlier, Antoine Barnave. Uh, he was a correspondent with Marie Antoinette, and he, he was all for constitutional monarchy. He had a duel with Casal, this man. French art or politician. Uh, he also wasn't as radical, but he was in the faction of Mirabeau, so these have jewels. I mean, it doesn't quite add up that these were trying to, this was an act or a way of the nobility or the, the right part of the assembly to come back at them, but, you know, the jewel of Barnave and Casal in the minds of some is a cause for suspicion. Barnave was received the Jacobins with embraces, fed with rebukes. So you can see here the sort of level of suspicion we get. I am one, cries the young Duke Castrier, fast as fireflash Lameth replies, tout à l'heure, shades of dusk thicken in the Bois de Boulogne. So another case there being the Duke de Castriers in the Bois de Boulogne, another a, a green area for dueling. Lameth skewers only the air and slits deep and far on Castrier's sword point, his own extended left arm, whereupon with bleeding pallor, surgeons, lint and formalities, the duel is considered satisfactorily done. Black traitorous aristocrats kill the people's defenders. But it shall be hung that steals a nail is just more invocations of the suspicion and the heightened level of daily life. It is a plebiscitium or informal iconoclastic decree of the common people of the course being executed. The municipality sits tremulous, deliberating whether they will hang out the drapeau rouge and martial law. Royalism totally abandons the Bobadillian method of context. And the twelve spatter sounds return to Switzerland, or even to Dreamland, through the Horn Gate, which soever their true home is. So eventually this level of suspicion, was it hysteria, was there any truth in it, doesn't matter really to Carlyle because it dies down. They go back to wherever they came from, either Switzerland or Dreamland. And they abandon the rapier method, as it was plainly impracticable. Chapter 4. To fly or not to fly? And we're building up here in this chapter now. Carl, in the first three chapters of this book, has sort of laid the scene of where France is at. Now we're going to get into 
why the book is called the Tuileries, into the mindset of the king. The truth is, the royalism sees itself verging towards sad extremities, nearer and nearer daily. From over the Rhine, it comes asserted that the king in the Tuileries is not free. This is the poor king that may contradict with official mouth, but in his heart he feels often to be undeniable truth in it. Civil constitution of the clergy, decree of ejectment against dissidents from it, not even to this latter, though almost his conscience rebels, can he say nay, but after two months hesitating, signs this also. It was on the January 21st, of 1791, that he signed it. And how low how it made him remember another 21st of January, in which he gave the uh, edict to begin, or the States General, as it would have been there, before it morphed into the National Assembly, as we had in Book 3. Blue National Guards encircle the Tuileries. A Lafayette, thin, constitutional, pedant, clear, thin, inflexible as water, turned thin to ice, whom no queen's heart can love. So Lafayette guards the Tuileries. He is of the constitutional middle ground, uh, but the, the royalists do not like him. From without, nothing but Nazi revolts, as we saw in the previous book, uh, Bouillet, out in the east of the country. Sack of Castria hotels, riots, seditions. The plan of royalty, so far as it can be said to have any fixed plan, is still as ever that of flying towards the frontiers. Flight to Bouillet, then. So Bouillet, we saw in the last book, a bit of a counter-revolutionary figure. Will they fly to him? Can they, get, can they escape? Can they get to him? The Jacobinism then revolt, and with one wild whale, fly into infinite space, driven by grape shot. So sort of flee, let, the, let it burn itself out, and then come back in and restore order. It were perhaps possible with a man to do it. So Carvalho thinks this was doable, but it needed the character to perform it. And as we know, Louis XVI is not of great character. If such an uh, inexpressible whirlpool of Babylonish confusions, which our era is, cannot be stilled by man, but only by time and men, man may moderate its paroxysms, may balance and sway, and keep himself unswallowed on top of it, as several men and kings in these days do. Much is possible for a man. Man will obey a man that kens and cans, and name him reverently their kenning, or king. Similar theory taken straight from his heroes and hero worship. Did not Charlemagne rule? Consider too whether he had smooth times of it, hanging four thousand Saxons over the Vesa bridge, at one dread swoop, so likewise, who knows, but in this same distracted fanatic France, the right man may verily exist. Royalty never executes the evasion plan, though. Yet never abandons it, living in variable hope, undecisive till fortune shall decide. There is plot after plot, merging and submerging in the meantime, or falling off from the old splendour then of Versailles that they have now in the Tuileries. There are young royalists, though, at the Theatre of Vaudeville. They sing couplets, but that could do anything. It is in these places and these months that the epithet saint culotte first gets applied to indigent, indigent patriotism. In the last age, we had Gilbert Sanculot, the, in, the indigent poet. There does disclose itself one quantum salience of life, and feasibility, the finger of Mirabeau. So, royalism seems trapped in the Tuileries. Yet there is this outlet, that figure of Mirabeau, who now seems to, you know, he doesn't want to lose control of the revolution. He's starting to make overtures back to the royalists. He will do constitutional monarchy. He doesn't want it to go down the Republican model. So in Mirabeau, he's met with the Queen of France. They have parted with mutual trust. With a Mirabeau for head and a Bouillet for hand, something verily is possible, if fate not intervene. Patriotism is patient of much, but not patient of all. Then. Deputations and change of ministry were many. Mayor Bailey, who was a mayor of Paris, joining even with the Cordelier Danton and such. So... There's a big churn of who's actually in what position within the National Assembly in this time. And they prevailed. But with what profit? Of quacks, willing, constrained to be quacks. The race is everlasting. There is neither bread nor peace. If you recall Lenin's saying, you know, um, which kicked off the Russian Revolution, all he wanted was peace and bread. So that's a, it's a, it's a classic trope. Carlyle stating it there uh, eight, some 80 years before Lenin. We reach the 19th of February, 1791. There's mesdames quitting Bellevue and Versailles with all privacy. They're off towards Rome, seemingly. Oh, one knows whither, not whither. So the court, the, the hangers on of the court, with the mesdames and so on, um, are starting to flee. They're starting to want to get out of here. There's escort, 
patriotic mayor or mayorette of the village of Moray tried to detain them, so they got detained on their way out of Paris, or the outskirts of Paris. Did the poor ancient women go their way to the terror of France and Paris, whose nervous excitability has become extreme? The National Assembly then answers not without an effort that the madames may go, after much gesticulation. Whereupon Paris raises worse than ever, screeching, half distracted, there's common a Berthier, a Berthier whom a great things unknown lies for the present under a blockade at Bellevue and Versailles. This is a state of nervous excitability which such few nations have ever known. Chapter 5 The Day of Boniards, which uh, is the 28th of February 1791. So the Day of the Boniards is the Day of the Dagger. Boniard being a a short, sharp dagger that people could carry in, in disguise in their uh, pockets quite quite quickly. So let's see what um, Carlyle has to say about this day, this day of daggers, the French Revolution. Things are, it's another, like the jewels we had earlier, this is another flaring up of suspicion, counter suspicion. It means there's visible reparation cast in the Vincennes. Other jails are being crooked, so there's jail in Vincennes. Other jails being all crowded with prisoners, new space wanted here. Uh, that is the municipal account. So when you get suspicious, <laughs> overly suspicious, your jail's starting to overflow. Which municipal account? Which one will has the correct authority for this? Was not Vincennes a kind of minor Bastille? Great Diderot and the philosophes have lain in durance there. Great Mirabeau in disastrous eclipse for 42 months. So the Vincent, Vincennes, which you see here, uh, is kind of like a Bastille, uh, further out, to the east of Paris. And again, if we get our map up, just to give you a lay of the land. Here's the Chateau of Vincennes. Here, this is the sort of fortress that we had. Still standing, unlike the Bastille. And you can see it's to the east of Paris. Of course, it's being engulfed by the city in post-industrialism, but really, the Bastille would have ended most of Paris this gate, this would be a sort of gate here, and it would be just on the outskirts uh, before you went into the countryside. All of this would have been quite countryside-like. So it's a straight shot really here down this Cour de Vincennes, Vincennes, as you see here. This is the Cour de Vincennes, hits the Place de la Nation, and then it carries on uh, from the Bastille to the Vincennes. So if we get, you know, a great day taking down the Bastille here as a Mark of any tyranny, why not the, the Vincennes as well? It is said that there runs a subterranean passage all the way from the Tuileries hither, so all, it's also linked with the idea that the king might escape through a passage to Vincennes. Who knows? Paddy, mind, quarries and catacombs. They're hanging wondrous abysses beneath. There is a Tuileries sold to Austria then, and Koblenz, since the foreign fellow coming in, should have no subterranean passage. Swear Moutier with his legions of mouchards deserve no trust at all. Then we reach the 28th. Uh, day of February, Saint Antoine turns out, as it is Saint Antoine being a sort of district, as it is now often done, and apparently with little superfluous tumult moves eastwards to that eye sorrow of Vincennes. Quick then, let Lafayette roll his drums and fly eastward. For all constitutional patriots, this is again bad news, because they don't want the acceleration to continue. But effervescence probably got up by Dolion and company, the overthrow of Throne and Altar, Saint Antoine. Gamblings of that patriot suburb, those jeerings, the provocations, which is all out in the streets now and are hard to endure. Unwashed patriots jeering in sulky sport, one unwashed patriot seizing a general by the boot to unhorse him, so the crowd is moving eastwards from the Bastille Saint Antoine area towards Vincennes. Meanwhile, the rest of Paris, with more or less uncertain, may mind the rest of its business. So, this isn't even all Paris, uh, sort of the top of the lower of the country, it's just a district decided to take on Vincennes. But what is this but an effervescence of which there are now so many? Mirabeau was often at the Tribune this day. There can murmurs and clamours from left and right due to this man like Tenerife or Atlas unremoved. I will triumph or be torn in fragments, he was once heard to say. Silence, he cries now, and strong word of command and imperial consciousness of strength. Silence the thirty voices. Silence pour point voir. And Robespierre and the Thirty Voices die in mutterings, their Thirty Voices being the most extreme left in the Assembly. And the laws, once again, more as Mirabeau would have it. So he still has the authority. Lafayette has saved Vincennes, uh, meanwhile, militarily. So Mirabeau has saved the political situation, Lafayette has saved the insurrection situation. 
and is marching homewards. Uh, royalty is not yet saved, though, however, nor indeed specially endangered, but to the king's constitutional guard, to these old guard Francaises, or centre grenadiers, as it chance to be. Is his majesty verily for Metz, then, to be carried off by these men on the spur of the instant? Or keep a sharp look at these centre grenadiers. Not duty here. God never came from the men in black. The men in black is a reference to Weber. What is this that sticks visible from the lapel of Chevalier, uh, Chevalier de Corps? And now we're getting to the day of the poniards. Where is the poniard coming into this? What sticks from him? The Chevalier de Corps. Too like the handle of some cutting or stabbing instrument. He glides and goes and still the dudgeon sticks from his left lapel. Hold, Monsieur, a Santa Grenadier clutches him. Increasing multitude at nightfall. Have they daggers too? So there's been a, an assassination or at least a uh, murder of a Santa Grenadier guard. By this mysterious Chevalier de Corps. Hapless men in black, at last convicted of poniards, are made to order Chevalier of the, Chevaliers of the Poniard. So suddenly there's these men in black going around just killing Sandra Grenadiers. There's more history about this. Such sight meets Lafayette in the dusk of the evening as he returns successful with difficulty at Vance's end. Saint Culotte Scula, hardly weathered. Here is aristocrat Charybdis gurging under his lead. References to the Odyssey there. Between Scylla and Charybdis lies Lafayette. He is between the San Culottes and the aristocrats. One figure running for its life, this Crispin Catalan de Spremenil. Remember, we had this Spremenil used to be speaker of the old Parliament of Paris for the last time, or the last but one. It is not yet three years since the same Centre Grenadier, Garde Francaise, then uh, marched in towards the Calypso Isles in the grey of the May morning, and he and they have yet got thus far. Buffeted, beaten down, delivered by popular pétillon. He might well answer bitterly, and I too, monsieur, have been carried on the people's shoulders. A fact which popular pétillon, if you like, can meditate. So there is a sort of insur insurrection of character to this man pétillon. He will eventually become the second mayor of Paris. For now, he's just um, invoking uprisings. And now, uh, now the crowd of the revolution has moved past where de Premenil was. When de Premenil gets carried away, he can say to pétillon, here, I was once where you were, and look where I'm going now. Vincennes stands undemolished and repairable after the insurrection. Patriotism, as usual to royalists and even constitutionalists, intend on stealing uh, Majesty to Metz, though that, that idea of the king still flying to Metz hovers. It's also usual to the preternatural suspicion, Phoebus Apollo having made it himself like the knight. Long, contending elements of French society then dashed forth into the singular comico tragical collision. For the present of the day is Lafayette's and the Constitutions. So this is the con this volume is all about the Constitution. It's the day of Mirabeau. It's the day of Lafayette and these types and how it's not going to work for them. That's kind of their undoing before we get to the guillotine, which is going to be volume three. Nevertheless, hunger and Jacobinism, fast growing fanatical, they still work. So the day is Lafayette's, but Jacobinism and so on, they still have the momentum. Chapter six, Mirabeau. Spirit of France waxes ever more acrid, fever sick towards the final outburst of dissolution and delirium. Suspicion rules all minds. The anvil rings during this March month, so around March 1791, with the hammering of pikes. Constitutional municipality promulgated its placard that no citizen except the active or cash citizen was entitled to have arms. So this is the constitution trying to fight back. Incorruptible Robespierre has been elected public accuser and new courts of judicature. Virtuous Petion, it is thought, may rise to be mayor, and as we can see here, he will rise to be mayor. Cordelier Danton, called also by triumphant majority, sits at the departmental council table, colleague there of Mirbeau. Von incorruptible Robespierre, it was long ago predicted that he might go far, mean, meager mortal though he was, for doubt dwelt in him not. Play at Doe royalty. If there be a chance left, this seems it and verily the last chance. So, what Carl is saying there is Mirabeau is still in power, and that's your chance. But you've got Danton's moving into greater position of power and getting the multitude of powers behind him. You've got Robespierre doing the same, and you've got this man, uh, Jérôme Petion de Villeneuve, also heading to be the new mayor. This is a small window here for royalty to actually be able to enact something. Royalty in all human likelihood will not play its trump card. To the honours, one after one, be mainly lost, and such trumping of it proved to be the sudden finish of the game. Mirabeau, 
whom royalty takes deep counsel at this time, as with the Prime Minister that cannot yet legally avow himself as such, heard God his arrangements completed. The king carried out of Paris, but only to Compiègne and Rouen, hardly to Metz, so to the north, so to the northwest rather than to the east of them, hardly closer to Coblenz and uh, the border, but at least to be out of Paris. Jacobinism and Mirabeau were then to grapple with their Hercules and Typhon duel. Giant Mirabeau walks in darkness, as we said, companionless on wild ways. What his thoughts are during these months? There is no record, no biographer, nor vague feel adaptif that will ever disclose. He is nevertheless a Herculean man. In turn, a scene duel within him. There is monster after monster he has to deal with. The king, uh, he has to deal with the queen also. She is the courage for all noble daring, an eye and a heart, the soul of Teresa's daughter. It's a shame the king doesn't possess it. She is the only man, as Mirabeau observes. So Mirabeau would be a student observer of character. He realizes there's a reason he's having counsel with the queen at this time, not the king. He knows who is more likely to be in charge of the situation in terms of the most inner more family, family royals. Moriamo pro regge nostro. Such a day Mirabeau writes may come where royalty will reassert itself through the queen and through her son. But had Mirabeau lived, the history of France and the world may have been different. Further, the man would have needed, as few men ever did, the whole compass of that same art daring art dossier. So unfortunately, although Mirabeau has these plans to kind of get the get the royalty out of Paris, but not to Metz, but to Rouen, near, near enough to it, maintain the middle ground, maintain the direction of a constitutional monarchy in France. But he doesn't live long enough to see it. And that's why we move on to chapter 7, The Death of Mirabeau. But Mirabeau could not live another year. Any more than he could live another thousand years. Men's years are numbered. And the tale of Mirabeau's was now complete. It matters not to peremptory fate. Life is that pale messenger which gets from Horace. The fear, swear, and tear of such an existence has wasted out the giant oaken strength of Mirabeau, a fret and fever that keeps the heart and brain on fire. Herald shadows fit pale across the fire brain of his. Heralds of the pale repose. I am dying, my friend, dying as by slow fire. We shall perhaps not meet again when I am gone. They will know what the value of me was. The miseries I have held back will burst from all sides on France. It is the 27th day of March, proceeding towards the assembly. He had to seek rest and help in friend uh, de la Marx. And so on the last day of March 1791, he is beset in the rue de la Chaussée d'Anton, incessantly inquiring within doors there, in that house numbered in our time 42, the overwearied giant has fallen down to die. Crowds of all parties and kinds, of all ranks, from the king to the meanest man. King sends publicly twice a day to inquire. The people spontaneously keep silent during these days. Then we reach the second day of April, and Mirabeau feels the last of the days has risen for him. He longs to live, yet acquiesces in death, argues not with the inexorable. His speech is wild and wondrous, unearthly phantasms dancing now, their torch dance round his soul, the soul itself looking out, fire, radiant, motionless, scourged together for that great hour. I carry in my heart the death dirge of the French monarchy. The dead remains of it will now be the spoil of the factious. He gazes forth on the young spring, which for him will never be summer. The sorrowful doctor shakes his head, dormir, to sleep. Il ne souffre plus. His suffering and his working are now ended. The gloom then is universal. Never in the city was such sorrow for one death, never since that old night when Louis XII departed. It is. King Mirabeau is now the lost king. The true king of France, as we were calling him up until now. The born stone orators speak as it has given them. The sanculotic people with its rude soul listens eager. There is sermon after sermon, like the orders of a religion to this dead man. On the third evening of the lamentation, the 4th of April, there is solemn public funeral, and into a pantheon he goes for the great men of the fatherland, or grand homme de la patrie reconnaissante. He is the first tenant of that fatherland's pantheon, so he's entered into the pantheon. Mirabeau, first one to have done so. 
Voltaire's bones are by and by to be carried from their stolen grave in the Abbey Cellier to an eager stealing grave in his Paris uh, birth city. So they decide to move Voltaire in there, and of course it wouldn't be complete without evangelist Jean Jacques, too, as is most proper, must be dug up from Emmanuelville and processioned with pomp, with sensibility to the pantheon of the fatherland. He and others, while again Mirabeau, we say, is cast forth from it, happily incapable of being replaced, and rests now, irrecognisable, reburied hastily at dead of night in the central part of the churchyard St. Catherine, in the suburb of saint Marceau, to be disturbed no further. So Mirabeau doesn't even last long in there, even though he was the first person to be interned. So blazes out far seen a man's life, and becomes ashes and a capu mortu in this world pyre, which we name French Revolution. Look at this questionable Mirabeau, then. May we find there lay verily in him, as is the basis of all sincerity, a great free earnestness, nay, call it honesty, for the man did before all things see a clear, flashing vision into what was, into what existed as fact. Be it that his falls and follies are manifold, as himself often lamented, even with tears, alas, is not the life of every such man already a poetic tragedy, made up of fate and of one's own deservings, of Schicksal and Agnes Schub, which is a quote from Goethe. New Mirabeau's one hears not of. The wild kindred, as we said, is gone out with its greatest. The chosen man of France is gone. What things depended on that one man, that singular being? He is as a ship suddenly shivered on sunk rocks. Much swims on the waste waters. 